Thank you, Joy. Well, good morning. As our friends find their way to their seats, we welcome you this morning to worship here at Forest Hills. We are so glad that you're here with us to worship an amazing God. For those of you who are visitors, we welcome you especially to uh, worship this morning, and we'd like to get a record of your visit. And so if you look at the pew uh, ahead of you, to the guest card, if you don't mind filling that out and dropping it in the offering when it has passed here in a little while. We are so uh, very honored to have Miss Joy Blayshaw with us this morning to uh, lead in worship. Uh, Paul Tallman is away. Um, unfortunately, his father has gotten ill in Nashville, so he, uh, he left on Thursday and um, might be back sometime this week. So keep that family in your prayers, um, especially going forward as we remember them this morning. Um, as we start in worship, let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. God has graciously welcomed us into his place today. Let us greet those around us with the same love. So take a moment and greet those around you.
from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of, heaven, of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Please pray with me. We have heard your two great commandments. Love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbors as ourselves. Our Heavenly Father, please provide us the courage and strength to put the, these commandments into action, to share the love of the Lord with our neighbors and to invite them to this house of the Lord to fellowship with other believers. Amen. Our hymn of missions today, we actually have two, uh, 572 and 571. So I hope you'll join me in singing. We're going to sing the first two verses of 572, and then the first two verses of 571, and then we're going to come back and do the chorus of 572. <laughs>
will you pray with me? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of worship. More importantly, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to share our story with one another. We have that opportunity every single day, every single encounter that we have in our daily walk. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to give abundantly and generously and sacrificially to this church to further your work. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Our hymn of testimony this morning is 567, Share His Love, and we're going to stand and sing the first and the third verses.
It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? Hello, neighbor. Welcome to this neighborhood. I guess we can go home after that, huh? <laughs> I'm sure Mr. Rogers appreciates that. So what TV show was that from? Well, of, man, someone was paying attention to the start of that clip. So how many of you... All right, Fred, that's about enough of that. Let me go ahead. Wait for it. Wait for it. <laughs> oh. Sorry, it's showing on the back screen. You can't see that, but I can. So, anyway. So, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. How many of you grew up watching that show or watching it with your kids? All right? So, a lot of you, you know the tune, you know the walk in the door, the shoes go off, the sweater goes on. And for me, growing up, that show came on every day. And for me, that was 11.30 every morning on PBS. So that gave me a half hour of The Price is Right and then got me ready for lunch. <laughs> and so it always came on in a really good time to kind of quiet me down. But looking back on what I was used to and accustomed to during that time in my life, Mr. Rogers sticks out like a sore thumb. It, it's a show that is very simple, very quiet, very straightforward, no frills, no nonsense, and very simple, and in a lot of ways, sort of outdated. You know, when I was six, seven, eight, nine, I was watching uh, Power Rangers. I was more used to ninjas fighting and giant robotic, you know, monsters and ninjas and all kinds of crazy colors and noises. Or I like watching Nickelodeon to laugh um, a lot, like The Adventures of Pete and Pete and Rocco's Modern Life. And so really, from a very broad look at it, Mr. Rogers really fit nowhere into what I was used to. But every day about 11.30, I would at least find myself casually turning the channel to see what Mr. Rogers was up to that day. And the reason I think I still tuned in was because his show was, if nothing else, different. And it was different because it, was, it stood out from everything else on children's TV during that time. It was everything that every other show I watched wasn't. Very straightforward, very simple, very down to earth. And I think what made it different in a good way was the man himself, Mr. Rogers. And the fact that he cared for his television neighbors. He cared for the children he reached through the medium of television. Now, from an early age, he kind of understood he had a calling to serve. Uh, you probably didn't know this, but he actually went to seminary and was an ordained a Presbyterian minister. You know, take that home with you. Free fact of the day. So he always wanted to care and to help people, and he sort of was feeling this call to serve children, but he didn't know exactly how. So he's working in an odd job in the early 50s and comes home after a long day and sees his young son in front of the TV. Now, if you ever walked in on a kid who's just totally in tune to something, you know, a tablet or a phone or a TV, and they're just zoned in, you could be destroying the walls around them and they wouldn't know. Well, that's how his son was this day. So Mr. Rogers comes in, says hello, and his son doesn't move. Just keeps looking right at the TV. So Mr. Rogers is intrigued. What has his attention so in tune that he won't even notice his dad walking in the room? And so he did like any parent would. He walked in, he sat down, and watched what was capturing his son's attention. And what he saw was a TV show geared towards children, but the content was anything but child-friendly. It was two adults 
screaming and arguing with each other and throwing pies in each other's face. Now, his son is laughing so much right now, but Mr. Rogers sat there in horror. And he sat there in horror because this is what his son was coming home to, to watch and to learn and to grow off of. This wasn't healthy, productive, educational TV. It was showcasing all the wrong behaviors for adults to show to children. Not arguing, not fighting, not throwing things in each other's face. But what made Mr. Rogers different from a lot of parents who, who find stuff on TV and just turn it off, he didn't say, I'm done with TV. He said, you know what? This is a very, very powerful tool, tool that we have now. And as bad as this show is, we can redeem TV for a greater purpose. We can redeem TV shows to show that, kids, there, there are good examples for you out there. There are things to learn, and there's, there's so much to feel good about. You shouldn't come home to arguing and fighting and, and bickering like these adults are modeling for you. So he knew he had a calling. He knew he was called to reach this specific neighborhood, the children. And so he went out and started taking up odd jobs at local TV stations just to learn how a TV show was organized, assembled, produced, and put on. He went and took uh, courses in child psychology to understand the mind of children on the age demographic that he was attempting to reach so that, one, he could understand them, and two, they could understand what he was trying to say, trying to teach to them. So Mr. Rogers knew very intently what his neighborhood was and how he was called to reach it. And he loved them. Simply, that's what he did every day. He welcomed them into his house. He told them how grateful he was that they were there, that they were special just for being there, just for being themselves. And you know, when I look at the world nowadays, I wonder to myself if anyone is as dedicated to loving their neighbors as Mr. Rogers was. Now, maybe you've seen this in your neighborhoods, or maybe you've seen this in your own life, but the world is rapidly globalizing. It's getting bigger and bigger. It's more interconnected than it's ever been. But in a lot of ways, we're more isolated than we've ever been before. You ever get that feeling? And I think it's easy to do because, let's face it, there are a few reasons why. First, we're more mobile as a people now. We don't set up shop in one town or one job for the rest of our lives and there remain, but we're moving constantly. Current and younger generations are moving every two to three years based on jobs or locations. And so for them, why should I invest in my neighborhood? Why should I put down roots in this community when I know I'll be gone in two, three, or five years? It's just wasted energy. Not only that, the motivation to go and meet new people, to make new friends, to form new relationships. Now, why do I need that when I can have a device like this that can connect me with social media to any friend I've ever met? So if I have my old friends virtually, why do I need new ones in the real life? And perhaps, maybe you've seen this in your life too, but we're getting busier as a people too. The weeks pile on more and more stuff, and yet we dedicate less and less time to community building to walking down the street and saying hello, getting groups of people that don't know each other together, and just being with one another, forming these neighborhoods in our own lives. But, you know, God didn't want us to view the task of loving our neighbor as some sort of impossible or burdensome task. God wants us to take that command to love our neighbors as ourselves seriously and to live it out each day with joy and hope and love because what Christ says in the scripture this morning, it forces us to open up ourselves to others just as God opens himself up to us. And in loving our neighbors as ourselves, we can be the presence of Christ to those that we live near, work with, and play with on a daily basis. So the first question we consider out of the scripture is this, why? <laughs> okay, why is it so important to love my neighbor? And real quick, if I, can, if I can get by okay in my life without having to worry about anyone else's mess, without having to take the time to open myself up to them, to be vulnerable, for them to be vulnerable with me, that's hard work. And darn it, if I can get by okay without it, why should I invest in it? Why should I care? Whereas Christ speaks to us in the scripture from the Gospel of Mark, he reminds us that the importance of maintaining these relationships reflects 
how we care for and maintain our relationship with him. I'll be reading again our scripture this morning from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one, and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with, and with all of your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered correctly, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one asked him any more questions. So in the scripture this morning, uh, the teachers of the law, the people who know what the Old Testament, you know, for them the Hebrew scriptures was all about, come to Jesus and say, okay, all these things that you're saying and teaching about, you're an expert on the law, we realize that, but if you can take and simplify it down to the most minuscule level, what, you're, uh, what is God doing in our time and what does God's message really mean, boil it down for us. And Jesus says, Love God with everything that you got, with everything that you are, everything you ever will be, and love your neighbor as yourself. Simple words for an anything but simple task. But more importantly, it's interesting in how Christ lists these two commandments because it's very important to how we love our neighbors because, let's face it, we can never love somebody as genuinely and authentically and as powerfully as we can when we know the love of God in our own lives. See, God says the greatest thing you can ever do is to be in a relationship with me. See, worshiping God, growing with God, living with God, that's the goal. That's what we're aiming towards each and every day. And when we do that, we realize that God desires to be our God. It's not just a one-way street, but God wants to be our God. And not only that, God wants to be our neighbor. Ever think about it like that? God is our neighbor who doesn't ignore us. God is our neighbor who says, I don't care how late they had a party going last night. I don't care that they haven't cut the grass. I don't care that they never come by and send a Christmas card, but they're here, and I want to love them. I, I liken God to that guy in your neighborhood who, who brings you a cake every now and then or cuts your grass when you're at work or always brings a bag of oranges at Christmas time. It doesn't matter what your relationship with him necessarily looks like, but he is overwhelming in his love for you. And so in the first command to love God with everything that we are, we learn the value of a real relationship. We see the characteristics of a true and powerful relationship. We see self-sacrifice. We see unconditional love. We see so many things that we are supposed to model in our relationships with our neighbors. And in doing so, we can show Christ to them. And not only that, we start viewing our neighbors not as people we can ignore, but as fellow um, creations of God who are equally as loved by him as any of us are. You know, there's people in our lives that we see and interact with each and every day that, well, let's face it, we ignore. Maybe we don't know how to interact with them. Maybe we don't get them. Uh, maybe we don't want to even give the idea that they exist. But ignoring people doesn't mean that they disappear or that they become something less than human. If anything, when we ignore our neighbors or people we see on a very consistent basis, then quite frankly, we're the ones that become less than human. So God calling us to love him with everything that we are, we're supposed to be maintaining our relationship with him, growing it each and every day. And in loving our neighbor as ourself, we are called to show God's love to those that we interact with each and every day. So that's the why. Now it's the who. Who then is my neighbor? If I'm called to love my neighbor as myself, then please tell me, who is my neighbor? Well, 
as we looked at the scripture today, we, we hear a call and we understand a little bit about who our neighbor is, but I think the way we've been answering this question recently has watered down how the power of, um, excuse me, the importance of Jesus' words at the time that he spoke them. Now, rightfully so, we've come to understand the term neighbor to mean anybody around the world, any human being. We have a global fellowship of humankind, and we're called to love each and every person with God's love. Absolutely, that's right. But wrongfully so, though, we have ignored what Jesus would have been really getting at during the time that he was ministering. We've gotten away from a more realistic expectation of what it means to be a neighbor. Because when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, he wasn't saying the word neighbor to spur on some sort of global awareness that all of humankind are your brothers and sisters. He was meaning your real life down the street, cross the fence neighbor. And in the time of the first century, your neighbors weren't just your friends. They weren't just people who lived near you. They were your life. They were your community. They were your support system. They were your lifeblood. Everyone depended on each other for survival. And they loved them. They opened their homes to them. The hospitality was remarkable during, during these times because it was so needed. And the faith that was birthed and grown throughout the first century was birthed and grown because of love like this. Loving your neighbor, opening your homes to them, being hospitable, letting those around you feel your warmth and care and love for them, and simply just not ignoring them. And that's how the faith grew from village to village and town to town because neighbors took seriously God's words and said, you know, I love God and I'm supposed to love my neighbor, but I don't know how, but I'm just going to go out there and just see what happens. Sometimes it means stepping out on faith. Digging into something you don't completely understand, but you ask God to be with you in that moment. And the phrasing that Christ says after this, love your neighbor as yourself, was meant to remind us that, okay, let's be real. On on an everyday basis, we're probably more looking out for ourselves than anybody else. So as much care and concern as you have for A number one right here, you're supposed to show that much, if not more, for those that live near you for your real-life neighbors. In doing so, we can show the presence of Christ. So we have the why. Why are we supposed to love our neighbors? We have um, the who. Who then is my neighbor? Our, our real life, live near, interact with neighbor. Now comes the how. And here's where things get tricky. How am I supposed to love my neighbor as myself? Well, I wish I could stand up here and give you a really simple, like, infomercial response and a, and a blue button, uh, button up and khakis and to sell you on a 30-minute thing that will get you to love your neighbors so, so authentically and so real, and it'll take little to no effort from you. But I'm not a huckster, and I can't tell you step one, step two, step three, how you're called to reach and to love your neighbor. But what I can tell you is this, if we're really intent on loving our neighbor, and by that I mean loving the neighbors that we know we need to love, not the ones that make it easy, we might need to change. And I say we might need to change because chances are the people that God is really calling you to love who who live and work and interact near you probably don't sound a lot or look a lot like you. And that goes beyond any sort of racial or ethnic differences, but cultural and social perspectives are so different now, and from house to house and neighborhood to neighborhood, you don't know what you're walking into, but you know you're walking into a great opportunity to share God's love. So what does that mean? Maybe it means learning more about your neighbors. Maybe you're out of touch, but God didn't call you to remain ignorant. God called you to be educated, to learn how your mission field is growing and learning and what you might need a change in yourself to reach them. And once you learn what it will take, you have to actually change a little bit. And you know, I think that's what Mr. Rogers did. Because here's a guy who understood without a doubt who he was called to reach. He understood that he didn't really grasp the mind of a child, so he needed to learn more about how they operated and how they functioned. And as he was doing that, he realized that 
I'm who I am. And I'm not going to change the essence of who I am, but how I go about some things might need to change. And let's face it, he owned up to the fact he was an older white guy who usually operated in a sport coat, and dress pants, and dress shoes. But that might seem intimidating to a kid to walk in and basically have a doctor or a lawyer talking with you. So what did Mr. Rogers do? He wanted to cut the barrier, even at the most minuscule physical level, from them feeling approachable. I'm sorry, from him feeling approachable to them. So what did he do? Well, maybe that's why every show he took off his sport coat and put on a sweater. And the very act of seeming less businessy or less formal, maybe that made him more appealing to the youth. Maybe it seemed like his grandpa was in the room instead of someone else that, you know, maybe a principal or someone in position or authority. Maybe it took just a simple sweater to kind of convey love and concern. And maybe it did so with the shoes, too. He knew that he couldn't run and play and dance and take trolley trips to the neighborhood of make-believe in dress shoes. It'd be too loud. So maybe that's why he put on different shoes, to walk maybe a mile in their shoes, to be able to play, to be able to grow, to be able to undo knots at a quick speed when you're in a sermon. <laughs> but even at the most basic level, what things do you need to change in your life to reach your neighbor? What things do you need to go about learning about them? What things do you need to go about adjusting in your life in order to reach them, to communicate with them? Because it's not so much that we know everything. It's about how do we tell them in a way they'll understand and appreciate that at the most basic level, they are loved. That they are cared for not only by a neighbor who lives two doors down, but by an amazing and all-powerful God who loves them beyond any other description. Because let's face it, we're communicators. We're interpreters. And interpreters have to change how some generations understand things. It might take a sweater. It might take some tennis shoes. It might take a lot more. But you know your neighborhood. You know what you might need to change and what you might need to adjust in order to reach others for Christ. So, won't you be my neighbor? That's a question that we asked in the sermon title and Mr. Rogers asked at the beginning of each show. And the question, that question that we encountered this morning isn't asked by me or even by you. It's asked by your neighbors. And they're asking it whether or not they realize it or not. They're asking, is there anyone out here who cares about me? Is there anyone out here who, who knows of a better way of life than the one I'm living? Is there anyone who will show me that they care? And that question is being posed to you. Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you come into my life and show me there's hope? Won't you come into my life and show me that I am loved regardless of the mess I'm in? Won't you come into my life and show me that there's a God who loves me as much as anything else I can comprehend or imagine? So who is your neighbor? How are you called to love them? And what do you need to change to tell somebody in your life that they are loved by God? Let's pray. God, how beautiful it is to know that you are, in fact, our neighbor. You're our greatest neighbor, and you never let us go. You're right next door. You stop over and check on us every day. You, you care for us. You feed us. You nurture us. God, you are the example of what a neighbor should be. And God, in our lives, there are those that we notice or even ignore. God, let the scales fall from our eyes and see your creation. Let us see our brothers and sisters in life and in faith, and call us to them, God. Call us to them to love them, to be their neighbor, to, to care for them, and to let them know that you love them too. And God, work within ourselves. Help us understand what things might need to change in order to be your hands and feet, to reach others, and God, just to build your kingdom. God, do all these things in us and through us, we pray. Amen. This morning, we hope that you would take a moment to, as we uh, prepare for our last hymn, to, to worship, to pray, to reflect on what neighbor God is calling you to love and to serve and to grow with. And if you're here this morning and God sounds like an amazing neighbor and you haven't gone across the street to say hello, 
Today might be a good day to come and meet God right where he is. However you feel led to respond, we pray that you would do so. Hymn of Response is 569. So before we go, here's some affirming words from a friend of ours that we met earlier. And let the words he says to you be the words you speak to others today. Or together next time. We surely will. It's such a good feeling to know you're alive. It's such a happy feeling. You're growing inside and when you wake up, ready to say I think I'll make a snappy new day it's such a good feeling a very good feeling the feeling you know that I'll be back when the day is new and I'll have more ideas for you and you'll have things you'll want to talk about I will too We always have things to talk about, don't we? And things to do together. I look forward to our times together. You make each day such a special day. You know how, by just your being yourself. That's right. There's only one person in this whole world like you. And people can like you exactly as you are. I'll be back next time. Bye. See you next week. Go out and love your neighbors.